Hello and welcome! In this video series we are taking a look at portfolio theory with matrix algebra using Python. In this part I'm going over how matrix operations are implemented in Python and the follow-up video we are finding the optimal portfolio weights using those operations. Important disclaimer, concepts shown in this video are not an investment advice, video is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Alright, let's get started. This is our coding environment and this is a script from the University of Washington which will help you to get a better understanding of the matrix operations I'm using in the code. I will link this script in the video description. First of all, we need some libraries. Why finance to pull asset prices from the internet and NumPy for calculation purposes. Next, I'm going to set up a list containing assets and we are starting with two assets. I'm just taking the S&P 500 as an example, so this is the ticker symbol for the S&P 500 and I'm also taking gold. So just an example, use whatever assets you're interested in. Next I'm going to pull price data for those assets and store that in a variable df, providing the tickers list and I'm starting my analysis in the beginning of 2010 and I'm only interested in the adjusted close. Of course, don't mess up with the code here. And ending up with a data frame like this containing daily prices for both assets. So this is the price history for gold and this is for S&P 500. To make assets comparable, we need daily returns. And I'm working with log returns in this video. I have a whole video where I explain what are log returns and why one should use them. So I will link that in the video description. So calculating log returns, straightforward. We are creating a new data frame here, return data frame. Use NumPy's log function and provide df divided by the shifted df. So what is this doing? This is simply taking row wise one row and divides it by the previous row and then is taking the log out of that. And with that, we have daily log returns here, right? And we could take a look at the correlation now, so the diagonal of this correlation matrix has ones because this is the correlation of the asset with itself, which is of course always one. And this is the correlation between the S&P 500 and gold. So this and this is the same as this is a, uh, you can use that as a mirror. Okay, so we have a slightly positive correlation between the S&P 500 and gold. Now, as we have log returns, we can take a look at the um, development of both assets and we can simply take the cumulative sum here, right? So when you're using non-log returns, you have to be careful because they're not time additive, but I've explained that as said in the other video. So for now, we can just take the sum uh, to get the cumulative returns. So if you want to see that in a chart rather, you can see the development of gold, blue one here, and S&P 500 orange one here. So between 2010 and 2013, gold was outperforming the S&P 500, but after that S&P clearly outperformed gold here. All right. Now we also want to take a look at the mean returns, so the average return of both assets and simply taking the mean function from pandas or numpy here and you see that gold has a distinctly lower mean return than the S&P 500. So this is roughly two times the gold return here. But we also want to see what is the risk. So we are taking a look at the standard deviation, the vol volatility. And you see that gold has a lower standard deviation than the S&P 500. So we have a lower return here, but we also have a lower standard deviation, lower volatility here. Okay, so next we are going to take a look at combining both assets. So I want to have a portfolio of both assets and see how these numbers um, are coming up. So for that, let's take a look at the script. 
So we see return of the portfolio using matrix notation is you have a vector of weights. So let's say we have an equal weighted portfolio. So 50% invested in gold and 50% invested in the S&P 500. Then we have XA and XB here times the returns of those assets here. And then you see weight times return plus weight times return, right? And as the professor said here, similarly expected return on the portfolio is. So the average return is also the expected return. So you're just taking the weights times the return and sum that up. Or in metrics, words, you are taking the dot product here. So let's actually just do that. But first of all, we need a vector of weights, right? And let's assume we have an equal weighted portfolio. So you could create a weights vector like this, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and then you have a, a weights vector. But we want to make that flexible because in the course of this video, we want to not only take two assets, we are doing it for now to make things clear and easy. We want to have potentially 100 of assets here, right? So we need to find a way to make this weight vector flexible. I don't want to have a static weight vector. So how can we do that? We can use NumPy's convenient once function, creating a vector out of once with a certain length. And we're just providing the length of our return data frame, where it is, and then just the columns. So if I have two assets here, the length is two. If I have three assets, the length is three and so on. So we are just taking once and then the length of the return data frames columns. And with that, we are getting a vector containing uh, two ones here because two assets. Now, I always want to have equal weights. So I want to have 0 0.5 here. How can I do that? I can simply take the exact same vector and sum it up. So I just need one divided by two and have 0 0.5 here. One divided by two, have 0 0.5 here. Three assets, I have three ones here. Uh, then the sum of the vector is three and then I have one divided by three, 0 0.3 something. So I'm dividing that by this, but only summed, right? So just one divided by two in this case, one divided by three in the three asset case, ending up with a vector as we wanted to have, right? Equal weights vector. So currently we have 50% S&P 500, 50% gold. So this is our weights vector. Now expected return of the portfolio. Simply take the dot product out of the uh, weights vector and the expected returns, right? So we are simply taking the weights times our expected returns, which are nothing more than the average historical returns. And then we're taking the sum out of that. Or if you wanna do that way more convenient, and save yourself some code, you're just taking the dot products out of the means with the weights and you're getting the exact same number here. All right, so this is how you are calculating the expected return of the portfolio. So if we compare that with those uh, two expected returns for gold and S&P 500, you see that the expected return of this portfolio containing 50% gold, 50% S&P 500 is higher than the expected return for gold alone, but is lower than S&P 500 alone. Now you cannot only take the expected return, but also the risk of the portfolio, which is measured by the standard deviation. As a recap, we had slightly lower standard deviation for gold than for the S&P 500. So we need to have not only the expected return of the portfolio, but the variance of the portfolio. And this is shown here. And the professor was using a three asset case. We even have it simpler here. So you have to ignore everything what contains X, C here, right? 
So the two asset portfolio case, you're just taking the weights vector, take the dot product with the covariance matrix. So this is a covariance matrix. And in our case, we just have this part of the covariance matrix. And then you take the dot product with the weights vector again, ending up with the portfolio variance using this formula. So you are just taking this part, ignore this, and then this part here. So portfolio variance is simply the squared weight times the variance of the uh, uh, first asset plus the squared weight times the variance of the variance of the second asset plus two times weight one times weight two times the covariance of both assets. So let's do that from scratch first before using matrix multiplications like here or before using dot products. So the reason behind that is I just want to make it 100% clear so that you understand every single step here. So let's calculate the portfolio variance. Portfolio variance, we have our first weight, which is 0.5. We are squaring it, right? Multiply it with the variance of the first asset. How do we get the variance? We can take the covariance matrix of the return data frame. And with that, we have on the diagonal, we have the variance. So this is the variance of gold and this is the variance of S&P 500. This is the covariance between those two assets. So this is the same as this here. So he was using a three asset case. This is the two asset case. So we are taking the squared weight times the variance of the first asset, which is this variance plus the squared weight times the variance of, variance of the second asset. So we are just taking the second weight times, so first squared times the variance of the second asset plus two times weight one, weight two times the covariance. So just two times times weight two times the covariance, which is this value here. Okay, so this is our portfolio variance. So to get the portfolio standard deviation, you are just taking the square root out of this number, right? So just take the square root here and then you have the portfolio risk. Now, to make this calculation convenient and scalable, so because imagine you have to do that with uh, more than even two assets. So look at that, look at this mess. Whenever you are adding an asset, uh, you have to also account for this part here. So it's getting, with more assets, it's getting messy, right? So we wanna have the matrix version of, of, of the calculation right? And we are doing what the professor is telling us. So we are taking the dot product of the weights with the covariance matrix and then the dot product with the weights again. And with that, we are exactly doing what I just did here. So we are taking the covariance matrix, dot product with the weights matrix, and then take the weights and take the dot product again. So he was using a transposed vector here, you can do it mathematically. In that case, it doesn't make a big difference. But if you want to be 100% as the professor, you also have to uh, take the weights here and transpose it. But you see, it doesn't change here, right? So, but you can uh, transpose it here if you, uh, if it's more um, intuitive for you. So we have the exact same variance as we calculated by hand. So you can, in the end, take the square root out of that and have your uh, portfolio, sorry, your portfolio risk of that. Okay, and now let's compare that to what we just saw. So this is our portfolio risk and we have our portfolio return somewhere above here, right? So let's compare that with the single assets. So here we have the uh, expected return of those two assets and we have 
the risks of those two assets. So we have a risk which is distinctly lower than any of those assets, right? Taking a portfolio of 50% gold and 50% S&P 500. We have an expected return, which is slightly or distinctly, rather distinctly above gold and slightly below the S&P 500, right? So in finance, you are usually calculating the risk adjusted return in the form of the Sharpe ratio. So the professor is also covering that here somewhere in the script. Sharpe ratio, you see, uh, give me a second. Ah, there it is. So you're taking the expected return of the portfolio times the risk reward rate. We are not subtracting the risk reward rate for this video. And then you are uh, dividing that by the portfolio risk. So simply expected return divided by the risk, then you have the Sharpe ratio here. So to get the Sharpe ratios, we could simply, so of the assets themselves, we could simply just take the mean and divide it by the standard deviation. And these are the two Sharpe ratios. Now to get the Sharpe ratio of our portfolio, we can simply take this and divide it by the portfolio risk, right? And with that, you see that very interestingly, we are getting a better risk adjusted return using this portfolio. So the Sharpe ratio of uh, S&P 500 is 0.034 and of the portfolio is uh, 0.03 something six. So better risk adjusted return when we are equally weighting uh, S&P 500 and gold, right? So yeah, you can, I mean, you can add assets now, right? So if you, let's say you want to add Tesla to it, then you have a correlation matrix. See, okay, Tesla is has a quite a low correlation with gold, uh, but quite high correlation with the S&P 500. Makes sense in the first place. Can take a look at the assets, the expected returns and the risk. Then you can do the same for the error again. And now we see we have uh, equally weighted uh, one third here. Then you are taking the expected return of the portfolio, do all that stuff again. So let's just scroll down to the interesting part, the uh, sharp ratios here. So we have a sharp ratio of 0.046 of the portfolio. Uh, equal weighted for those assets. And with that, we are beating all the sharp ratios here, right? So it is very important that you understand these concepts for the next video, because in the next video, we are doing something very, very interesting. So right now we have equal weights here, right? But which combination of weights is giving us the maximum risk adjusted return, right? So which combination of weights is maximizing this value? And this is a very interesting optimization problem. And you can also take a look at uh, splitting the data set, set up a portfolio with some training data, let's say 70% of the time horizon, and then check would it be good to take this optimized portfolio and what is the return or the risk adjusted return of that portfolio taking data which the uh, optimization algorithm hasn't seen yet. So very excited for the upcoming part. I hope you are as well. And yeah, thank you very much for watching and I'm looking forward to see you in the upcoming video. Bye bye.